Okay, we're recording. Three, two, one. Ooh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 96 of the Security Podcast. And we had a topic pre-show last week that I thought we should take a little further with Tom. So I'm buying or potentially buying a new house, my wife and I. And the new thing I want to do is I've been hearing about, hey, if your router is older than like five years, it's time to upgrade. So I started looking. Tom's telling me that his router can do VPN and all this other stuff. And I start looking. My router can't do any of this. So I have like some FOMO of this fear of missing out. And so I decided, hey, let's I have this opportunity. Let's put this new router together. Let's how would you network this the right way, the secure way? Because you know the Internet of Things is coming, and we really need to make sure that that it's done right. So Tom's gonna walk us through like what you need. Yeah, and, and just just a disclaimer, uh, this isn't, you know, go out to the your favorite big box store, grab something off the shelf, go home, plug it in, and you're done. Uh, this will take some effort to put together. Uh, my network is pretty piecemeal. Uh, it's pretty non-pedestrian, I should say. I've seen more complicated setups, uh, but it's, it's more like a small office than it is uh, an average home setup. Look, if... Uh, I mean, here's my setup. I have a free NAS server downstairs that serves uh, that serves all my content. So I don't have a very I don't have a massive hard drive. Everything is wired in my house to the server. But we do have devices like we have our phones. We have uh, we have some other things that are wireless that do need to work. And with the Internet of Things coming, you want to make sure that they're secure. And if your guests come, they have a secure thing. And you know what? And you have to be flexible with it. Because remember, you do have a significant other who doesn't want to have to have to know security or doesn't want to have to reset everything or not know which button to press to get things done. So those are those are the constraints. Right. It's going to be easy enough for people to just jump into and be able to use your network at the drop of a hat, uh, but secure enough that you know no one's going to get you owned accidentally just by hooking something up. Correct. So I guess the first thing we start off with is the router, or do we don't even get there for you? Uh, let's go ahead and start off with the router. Um, so to, to do this thing 100% correctly, there's a lot of routers out there. There's a lot of good things you can buy. Um, for my setup, I actually built a PC and put PFSense on it. I made sure it had uh, three network ports. So you can do some cool things with that. Uh, two really should be enough, but three lets you do some more advanced things. Um, and that's really going to be the brains of the whole thing. Now, you can buy smaller boxes uh, that will run PFSense, um, but you don't have to. Uh, any spare PC with a, a couple of network ports should do fine. So my idea was... I'm not going to build my own micro ATX uh, PFSense box. I was looking at the PFSense website and hoping that there was something along the lines or going on Amazon and finding something, and there is. So we're looking at around $300. But I guess people are asking, why not the Lynx's blue box? I mean, the blue box has evolved. It's no longer blue. It's no longer a box. It's it's not called Lynx's anymore, but... For the most part, why can't we do what they call these Soho routers? Um, you can. There's nothing outlandishly wrong with buying a Soho router, grabbing something and out of the box, putting it on the shelf. Um, I know I, I personally have recommended Soho routers to people in the past. Uh, but if, if you want to manage it yourself, if you're interested in uh, you know, creating these, these separate little networks to segment your life and segment the devices in your house, uh, you've really got to have something more powerful. You have to have something that you can, you know, get into the guts of networking, actually get dirty with, uh, not something, um, I would say, general purpose, like most Soho routers are designed to be. You're, you're going to need a little bit more power. So, I mean, all of the, if, if you, like you said, if you want to dive into it, if you just want it to work, I think they're saying... Any one of them with the many antennas that you see and the, I guess, the 
two like two hundred dollar range is going to be your best bet if that's what you're going for. They're going to have this segmented guest network. They're going to allow you to do some things, but they're not going to allow you to do all the cool things. Right. I, I know the the one I personally recommend, and you know this is all subject to change. But if if I had someone who said, "Hey, I need to go to a big box store and I need to pick up a router today, right now." Uh, I know Asus has got a model for 150, 200 bucks. Uh, it's like the number one seller on Amazon, um, and it's gotten fantastic reviews. So go pick that one up. And but if you want to do something a little bit more custom, if you've got some time uh, and some, you you would like to learn how this stuff works, um, setting it all up yourself with PFSense is a great option. Which which I think I'm going to end up doing because I mean I have this extra little bit of money to spend because you're you're chalking it up to oh new house sensation we have this new thing let's set it up correctly so i i have a feeling that's the way i'm going to end up going i'm going to get something and and then so the router is done what's next what's next is you need some type of managed switch something you can log into um there's there's some core network concepts here uh, that I'll, I'll explain. One of them is a VLAN. It's like a, a smart network segment. Um, you can say, you know, in a given piece of, of Ethernet cable, of Internet cable, you can say, well, there's actually four or five networks running inside this cable plugged into a smart switch. And depending on which port you plug it into, you can say, well, uh, stuff coming out of this port is going to be stuff I really trust, and this one's going to be the guest network, and this other port is going to be my Internet of Things network, uh, and then this other port is used for my server, or however you wanted to build it. But a smart switch, a managed switch, will allow you to take uh, your, your trunk port, your uh, piece of Internet cable coming out of PFSense with a bunch of networks in it, and split it out inside of that switch. Plug it into a switch and have it come out a bunch of different ends, uh, but with some brains behind it. So, I mean, I guess what I want to do is anything that's wired, I'm going to trust almost exclusively. If you're plugged in, I'm almost positive. I mean, unless somebody, for the most part, anything plugged in, I'm going to, I have control of that system. And the things that are not plugged in, which is going to be the my Amazon Fire Stick or the phones or somebody coming with their phone or tablet. I'm going to put that on a separate, what do you call it, a VLAN, a separate network for them. Right, right, and that'll keep things segmented. So yeah, your your guest traffic, your untrusted traffic, will never touch the stuff you actually trust. It will still be able to get the internet and you know to any network resources you want to set up on the guest network, but. You know, if, if you've got stuff like if you've got your server on the trusted side, the guest side, if you set it up correctly, they'll never be able to touch, they'll never be able to reach each other. So, I mean, that's going to that's gonna be the main issue. It's the fact that I want to make sure that, that uh, let's say, my Amazon Fire or the Roku box, which are wireless, touch, they need to be able to access the server. So we have to make a decision on which which uh, devices can. Can you do that with the with the wireless network as well? Say this wireless network, with through PFSense, this wireless network and these ports go to this network and this other wireless network, the guest, and these ports go to the other network. So for wireless, you will need uh, an access point capable of doing VLANs because actually what you're going to do, uh, you've, you've got a couple options. With networking, it's like, Anything else you're building by hand, if you really want to get into the details of it, you can um, have a separate access point uh, with you know dumb ports coming off and actually saying, okay, yeah, this this piece of, of cable has got my production network, right, my trusted network, and I'm going to plug it into this access point, set up passwords on here, and that's one network, and then take another piece of cable your guest network cable and plug it into the access point and say, okay, this access point, this other one, uh, is gonna go over here and it's a totally different wireless network. Or what I've done is I actually have a Cisco access point uh, that is 
VLAN aware. It's VLAN capable. So I take uh, the piece of internet cable with a bunch of networks coming off of it. I plug the single cable into the access point, into the wireless device. Uh, and depending on the VLAN, depending on the segmented network, it says, oh, well, this VLAN number is production, it goes over here, and this VLAN number is guest, and it goes over this way. And it, the device itself actually keeps those separated. See, this is where we get to, well, I understand exactly what you're saying, and people listening to this understand, but the significant others now are like, hey, I just want internet to work. Right. Why are you adding this extra box, this access point, it looks ugly. There's a green light or a blue light or a white light. I don't know what it means. It looks like a UFO. It's something else for the baby to grab. And now we're getting into, uh, do we really need this? But let's say, let's continue with it because we can go back later. Yeah. So now you're saying access points. But I thought you said, and I'm playing dumb here, I thought you said that we got a wireless router. Like your PF Sense has some like little antennas coming out. Why do I need more access points? You can get uh, tiny little PF Sense boxes that do wireless. It's totally a feature they support depending on the wireless chipset you buy. Uh, but PF Sense isn't known for doing wireless. It's not the you know the feature that they've got labeled on the box and in, in big bright red letters. Uh, it is not its first feature. Um, so you'll you'll probably want an access point, something that does Wi-Fi uh, as its first and main job. PFSense can do it, but you know, you're know, you about to, to buy a house with a bunch of floors and your your router, your, your main box is going to sit in, you know, it could be in the basement, it could be in the garage, it could be in the corner of the house. I know, you know where my wireless is and where my router is. And it's not a great spot to put wireless. It works, but really putting wireless towards the center of the house uh, would give you much better signal to uh, you know, reach all the devices and all the extraneous corners and nooks and crannies. Um, so a lot of the time you'll want to take an access point and mount it somewhere where it can actually give really good signal and keep your other network gear away from it. So it's, I would say it's not really... I'm not going to say it's not recommended, uh, but it would probably be better to have your own access point instead of letting PFSense do it itself on the box. The, the other issue is that now these access points, and I understand what you're saying. This is, this is a coverage thing. A lot of people call me up and say, I have really bad Wi-Fi in this corner of my house. Right. What can I do? And if you, go to, if you go to the big box stores, they tell you to buy all these things. And really the trick is, it's as simple as moving your box around. If you move the box on the different antennas, if you can move it even a few feet in a different direction, you're gonna get way better coverage. I mean, they have, it's called, what is it, the Pringles can, the cantenna? The cantenna. The cantenna? I love I the mean, cantenna. It's, it's literally a Pringles can that they that they dismantled almost, and they put it on the antenna, and surprisingly it works because it amplifies the signal directionally to these, to these poor corners of the house. But if you're gonna, if you're start, like I said, you're starting from scratch. You get putting an access point on every floor is not necessarily the worst thing in the world because now you're gonna get a really strong signal. But I think now you're you have to run a wire, you have to run at least an Ethernet wire to it. Right. Right. Yeah. They they, then, they do have to be wired in some way. You can't. They can't take the weak signal and amplify it. Uh, they can. Oh. Uh, you can set them up to do that. Uh, again, there's a lot of options with this. You can do it that way. So if you wanted to have, you know, an access point wired from your PF Sense box and and you know sitting just a couple feet, and then you've got other access points in repeater mode, just daisy chain throughout the house. Sure, you can do that. But if you're on the last link of the chain, it's going to slow down your connection as it makes hops to try to get back to your main box. It's really hard to explain to somebody. One of the things I wish they had was a completely wireless uh, security camera. Yeah. Like, I'm surprised, like maybe now they have it, and I think I saw one recently, but I got some something on Woot a few years ago, and it's like uh, wireless IP cam, except for the power cable. I said, that's a waste. I want literally wireless. I want no wires. I want just, I just, 
I, I understand that it's battery. I understand that it's going to have once a month. I'm going to have to change your battery and do this. But you just don't have power everywhere, especially where you want to have a wireless camera. So the same thing with the with the with the wireless. The reason you're putting wireless in is because you can't put a wire, and now you're saying you're you have to put a. Not only do you have to put power, you have to put uh, an Ethernet cable, unless you do power over Ethernet, and you have that problem. Right. Right. So yeah, you you do have to. You know, do some crawling around and uh, and install these access points with some wires. But the benefit of that is you do this once with you know one device for one access point or three if you're going to put in three of them. Um, there's no magic number. It all depends on you know your house, what the walls are made of, what kind of coverage you need. Uh, it really all depends on your particular setup. Uh, but yeah, you, you will have to run some cable, but you have to do it for the access points, not every device. You do this once and it's over, it's done with. Now, power is an interesting question because most of your standard small office, home office routers, the Soho routers, do not do power over ethernet, which is, you know, I buy this specialized switch and I have one cable I've got the Ethernet cable, I plug it in, and it lights up like a Christmas tree. It's working just out of the box. Um, and they're going to require power. They're going to require a, a wall wart, a, a socket plug of some type. Uh, the ugliest socket plug you've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, which is, of course, you know, nearly impossible to replace if it breaks, which they always break. Um, the, the good access points, they are more expensive. They will support power over Ethernet. Uh, I know mine does, that's how I use mine, uh, but I actually, because it's the only power for Ethernet device I have, I didn't want to buy a really expensive unmanaged switch that does PoE or power over Ethernet. Uh, instead, I bought this cheap power injector, which plugs into the wall, the data goes in from the switch, and it says, okay, this goes out to your access point, and it's, it's just a pass-through it adds power to that line. Uh, so at the end of the day, you run that singular cable, but you don't have to bother with having a really expensive switch, which is nice. So you're saying, okay, so I think we're gonna take a step lateral and you're saying switch and you're saying unmanaged versus managed. So the next thing is all these wired devices that we're talking about, and I'm okay with running wire because one of the things you don't understand, Gigabit is fast. Yes. So gigabit stands for 1,000 gigabits. And if you know your binary and your eight conversions, you divide by eight. That means you're moving 125 megabytes a second. Okay. Your internet speed is from the from wherever is probably 50 mega, megabits. So again, divide by eight. You're getting seven megabytes a second. Okay. So you're talking about 13, 14 times, 15 times faster. And this is to move files. Wireless is wireless and I think is 108. If you have line of sight, I think wireless end is 108. I thought it was 300 theoretical. In practice, you usually hover around 150. I thought so I could either, be wrong. Either way, 150 is way lower than 1,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's, if you have a wireless, that's in the best conditions, right? That's that's saying, hey, I have line of sight. I can look up and see the access point hanging on the wall. Not, well, it's somewhere, and I have bars on Wi-Fi. This is five bars on Wi-Fi. This is direct line of sight. Yeah. This is you're the only one on the network. This is everything you're getting. Like, like you said, I thought it was 108. Maybe that was the draft end spec way back when. Now you're at to like 150. But still, 1,000 is – there's an extra zero in there somewhere. Yeah. I mean, 150 to 1,000. It's it's a lot faster. It's an order so of magnitude. Getting, okay. Plus, you have the security things that you're wired in and you're not wired. And you can transfer these things over one cable. It's just you connect it next to the file server it can spit and it can go fast so you're putting this on you need the place to plug in all these wires because each one is a direct run to that computer so you're putting this on and i right now have an unmanaged switch i have a 16 port unmanaged switch because i let my router handle everything but what you're saying is to get a managed switch so you can do some 
per port controls? Yeah, so I actually I recommend both. So managed switches, uh, because they're managed, because they've got some brains to them, tend to be a bit more expensive than the unmanaged varieties in just about every case. Uh, so what I recommend is actually getting a small managed switch because you don't need to manage a bunch of ports. Really, the majority of your ports are going to be uh, tr this trusted zone or, or this you know production internet, as I call it, on my network. Um, so you've got the the managed switch putting out you know a, a port or two of production traffic. Hook that to your unmanaged switch, which has got a bunch of ports, and it's dumb. It's just a port replicator, basically. Um, and that's where you would do your branching from. That's where you would run all your cables to all the rooms in your house and plug everything into it. Um, the, the unmanaged switches tend to be, you know, they're, they're fast. They're gigabits or faster, um, and they're going to be cheap. You can get a 24-port for a hundred ish dollars. Um, and you I probably like a, don't need anything bigger than that. I think I have a 16 for something like 50. This is unmanaged, but you may be right. You may be onto something is to have my 16 port over there and have that go into one of the, un, to one of the managed switched ports and then, and then do, then do all that stuff from there. But again, it's again, look at, Look at the complex. This is just all to be secure. This is what we're trying to get at from the beginning. You're trying to be secure. You're trying to make sure that no one's breaking in, that everything is segmented, and you can see the complexity that we start doing. Yeah, you can. You can even you know combine this with uh, you know the crazy setup I have, which is whole house VPN. So I can set up PFSense uh, because it's. You know, it, it's a free BSD box. It's got a, an entire operating system loaded onto it, not a mini thing that kind of sort of works. It's a real computer with real power behind it. You can do things like say, hey, uh, go out, connect the VPN network, and take all of my traffic from this network and force it to go out the VPN. And, you know, also don't let it touch the guest network. And you can even do the same thing with your guest ne network if you want to have people go through your VPN or not. You know, it's, it's up to you. You can do what you want. Um, but it, with PFSense, you can do a lot of cool things like uh, set up parental controls and say, hey, these sites are blocked. These sites aren't. Or uh, time lock control it's saying, hey, these devices on this network segment, they lose access at, you know, 10 p.m. at night. So if you wanted to, you know, shut the kids out of internet at 10 p.m. at night when it's bedtime, you could totally do that with PFSense. Uh, and that's that's actually one feature that most small routers now support. It's they're starting to move into the parental control space. One of the things that people complain people complain about with FiOS is that they give you a router. But I've actually been seeing a lot of reviews about their new router saying, you know what? They're they're not great, absolutely, but they're not bad. It's it, for something small that if this is all you want to do, you want to give some Wi-Fi. It has the built-in guest network. It has these good quality of service controls, good DNS, all these little things, dynamic DNS. It has it, and if that's all you want, that's great. And that was the next. That was the segue into the next idea. So we're we're driving you crazy. You're probably saying, "What's going on?" I just want something somewhat somewhat secure I, I i need some convenience can't i just do something else can't i just get this d-link and or this Verizon router and just turn on the guest network so with the guest network it's it's so hard to give a, a blanket recommendation because i've seen i've seen people do this correctly and i've seen people and by people i mean manufacturers do this poorly um, I've seen, you know, the great thing that we're talking about with, you know, like the PFSense setup of someone's uh, built a router and it does VLANing and it actually puts out different Wi-Fi networks with different settings based on a VLAN. I've seen it to where it just double nets uh, uh, another network on top of yours and that's not great. It, it works, but it's not great. Uh, I've seen it to uh, these manufacturers create a guest network where they take your network name, tack guest onto the end of it, 
and it actually doesn't do anything on the back end. When guests connect to the open network, they get dropped onto your network segment with your devices. Uh, I've seen manufacturers use, um, you know, dumb and, and pretty ineffective firewall rules to try to uh, keep those networks segmented instead of doing true segmentation. So you'll have to research if it comes to a guest network what your particular device does and whether or not it's secure or not. Um, really, the best recommendation is if it does true network segmentation, VLAN is the keyword. If it does a guest network on a different VLAN, more than likely, it's a decent choice. Uh, now, I can't give a blanket recommendation. If you'd like to shoot me the specs or shoot me details, I can take a look into it. Um, but, you know, uh, just saying any guest network functionality is perfect, it's far from the case, unfortunately. But, you know, for, for the small things you can do, if you want to be easy, if you're not worried about a guest network, it, take a, just take your router, WPA2 on your wireless. Use a big key, right? Use something that's 12 characters or more. It, it, don't go any lower than 12. Uh, WPA2 personal is perfect. Don't mess with the enterprise stuff. It's something different and you won't need it. WPA2 personal is great. Um, if you get the option for WPS, for Wi-Fi protected setup, uh, do not turn that on, or if you can, disable it at all costs. Uh, what it is, is it's basically a, it's kind of a backdoor uh, into your Wi-Fi network that was created incorrectly by just about everyone, and it's easy to hack. So if you can, disable that entirely. Uh, and those two things will put you on a decent road. And then finally, let's say, and this is what I actually have, I have my main router. I disabled the guest network because I'm going to explain in a second. And I bought a second router. And I just put that on 192.168.1.2. And now I have a whole completely separate network. Should I worry about that? Can they, I mean, I guess anybody can, once they get on that, they can try and backtrack. But is there a real problem with that? Um, they could try to attack NAT. They could try to get through. Um, I, it's not the most recommended approach. I would say it works. Um, again, doing doing VLANs, is, it's really a, an elegant solution to this, but if you don't have any other option, it's not the worst thing in the world to do. You are going to have to manage two different devices, and you'll have to keep both of those devices up to date when firmware comes out. That's another thing that I don't like about most Soho routers is you've got to keep them up to date. Hardly anything self-updates when it comes out. Um, I know uh, I've dealt with some newer D-Link stuff that forces an update when you take it out of the box, which is nice. Uh, but a lot of the stuff, you know, you're stuck with the firmware out of the box for a long time unless you choose to change it. With PFSense, it works like a modern operating system. It'll say, hey, you've got updates. Click here and we'll reboot. And you click there and it does its thing and reboots and you're done. Um, it's really easy to keep locked down. I mean, the idea is if, you, if you're you just, if you just have the idea, well, I know I heard that, that people on my network can do these bad things, so I'm just going to buy a separate router. I'm going to have these two routers. One's going to be called home, and the other one's going to be called home guest. They're going to have two different WPA passwords. For the most part, I, I feel like for the average, not even the average person, for the person who doesn't really want one, they're good at that point. They just have to be a little more careful, like you said, update the firmware and everything else. What we were talking about in the beginning is if you want to do it the absolute right way. And I think that, and and I think just telling them what just buying two routers may be the, the simplest solution, but, or that's the solution for when you don't really want to worry about things. But to move on to what, what we discussed before is, like you said, with VLANs is the best way. Yeah, the, the two router solution, I could I could see it working. I'm going to have to do some mental exercise to see if I can break out of that sandbox. Um, in, in any case, it's not trivial. Um, but it's, it's not really the most elegant solution. I'll put it that way. I mean, I feel like if you're sitting in a house, in a single-family house, 
because what I know is that when I'm in on the street and my house is probably 30, 10, 15 feet away from the street, I have real trouble getting a Wi-Fi signal. Yeah. Like you have to be really nearby to get even some sort of decent Wi-Fi signal to the point that I probably know that you're around. So I, I, you, I have to throw that in. You're in, you're, you were in an apartment building where you turn it on and you see 15, 20 different networks. Yep. And no one knows where you are, so you can just sit there and hack all day, all day long. Yeah, it, it does really depend on location. So. So that was my big that was my big thing, and I think I'm going to go the first route where we discuss this. I'm going to take some shortcuts, but for the most part, I think spend the money on the router, maybe get an access point or two, and set up, and we can report back. But this won't be for a while. Yeah, and uh, also the management password. If you buy a Soho router, please, 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 please change that. I have been to too many places where, where the even businesses where the the router password is just admin admin. Uh, it's uh, kind of ridiculous. Change and if the you don't know password. it, yes, the default password is everywhere. You can type in dealing yeah. admin password and you will find it. Yep. So okay, well we're out of time. We're a little over, but that's okay. And if you have questions, I'll definitely be taught. We'll, definitely continue talking about this as I go through with it but there's there, we could talk about this for a lot longer about exactly now to look for a PF sense router and how to build one and the right access points and everything else but hopefully yep. this was a good idea on what to do and hopefully we will see you next week see you everyone <laughs>